to a new chapter of Now Serving Love. We dedicate this time to talk to individuals who have chosen to use their talents and their voice to uplift the collective consciousness. We are extremely blessed to be with you today. Namaste. Welcome to a new episode of Now Serving Love. I want to thank you all for joining us. And uh, first of all, I want to apologize because the last two weeks uh, we haven't been able to, to release new podcast. We had a couple of very interesting guests aligned for the episodes. However, we kept running into the same challenge. Unfortunately, sometimes people are not reliable and that's something I can really control. We can't really control that. So all we can do is just choose choose the direction we want to move on. And um, so I just didn't want to wait longer. Uh, so I decided to just go back to a little bit of the uh, format of the storytelling we were using during the quarantine. So here we are again, and I'm just really happy that I uh, get a chance to release a new episode. Today's story, it's called In the Business of Making People Feel Good. I remember clearly when I had the vision to move to the United States. I was about 24 years old living in Bogota, Colombia, had already graduated from university. And at the time, I was working as a copywriter at an advertising agency. During my last year at high school, when it comes to time to choose a path of career, I wasn't really sure. I was a really good soccer player plus I loved playing soccer I was very passionate about it and parts of me always dreamed that I could actually be a professional soccer player and also I wanted to be a airplane pilot so upon finishing high school I had to make a decision and that time at least in the early 90s Playing soccer in Colombia was not really an option. Mm. Having this love as well for arts um, and being creative, I thought I could choose a career that can combine uh, a good income and also have a creative aspect to it. And that's how I ended up working as a copywriter in the advertising agency. After, I think it was about two years of working as a copywriter, I had a a very strong feeling, which I actually had from before. But it was this feeling that I needed to, to lift my sales and sell into the world. I knew deep in my heart, and when I mean the heart, I don't mean the physical heart, but deep in the core of my being, I knew that there was there was an adventure waiting for me, that it was very important to navigate through different cultures, different worlds. I was pretty comfortable living in Colombia at that time. Uh, I make pretty decent money for my age, lived in a beautiful apartment. Uh, My family owned a couple of country houses. We were a member of also a couple of country clubs. I had a girlfriend. Basically, I had the the whole dream. However, this deep, deep feeling within kept calling me to, to move on. So I reached that point where it felt that if I didn't make that move in that very moment, I was going to easily fall into the comfort of the environment I was experiencing. I remember also it was a pivotal point reading 
the book The Alchemist uh, by Paolo Coelho. And the story, if you have read it, you know that basically that's that's the premises of the whole book. This young kid leaves everything that is familiar to him uh, to move into new lands and a whole new discovery. And it's followed with a great adventure. So in a way, that was that was very inspirational for me. And it came just the perfect moment. So I decided to move to the United States. In the end, a decision based on my intuition and the voice of my heart, which kept on reminding me that even though I had the most wonderful and comfortable life in Colombia, I needed to find the courage to set into the ocean of the unknown and navigate into the world of infinite possibilities. It was then that I left my beloved native Colombia, the streets that I knew, the language I spoke and dreamt in, my blood family, who for years provide me with nurturing love and support. It was then that I dove into the powerful current of faith. Faith not in the religious sense, but faith in the understanding that everything was going to be all right. The same faith, the same belief that has carried me throughout all my life, knowing that in the end, everything is going to be all right. So I allow myself to be carried into the unknown. I felt like in the book Illusions by Richard Back when he describes the cloud who doesn't know why it moves in such a direction and at such a speed. It just feels the impulse and moves towards that direction. Ultimately, the sky knows the reason and the patterns behind all clouds. Much in the same way we know it too. We just need to lift up ourselves high enough to see beyond horizons. June 20 of 1998, approaching now 22 years. I arrive into the uh, San Francisco International Airport where a friend of mine was picking me up. She had offered me a place to stay and uh, it was just a perfect beginning. Two main things I had in mind. I could try to play professional soccer in the MLS or also I could try to eventually moved to Los Angeles and study theater of arts. I had always this deep love for, for acting, for theater. So those were my two main ideas at the moment. The first one, playing professional soccer, was something I crossed out pretty quick in the first month or so. I got connected to this coach and um, he had connections with what was a professional team at the time playing in Modesto which is pretty close to San Francisco so he arranged for a tryout and I eventually I made into the team and I remember uh, one of the first training sessions a couple of players from the team were driving from San Francisco to Modesto and one of the players, he got a flat tire. So it was about three, four cars. So we stopped and um, the guy with the flat tire started taking his tools out and stuff. And me being Colombian and something's very natural, we always help each other. We always uh, collaborate in these kind of situations. I was about to help him and the coach told me clearly not to get involved. And I was like, why? He said, oh, you don't want to be reliable. If anything happens, you can be sued. <laughs> I really didn't understand that concept at all. 
Um, so it's just kind of weird. First of all, if we were supposed to be a team and play like a team and we're not even helping each other in these kind of situations, I don't know how this is going to work. And then eventually the game itself, uh, during the play uh, tryouts, the soccer game itself, it lacked soulfulness. It, it felt very mechanical. It just, I didn't really vibe with it. So I discarded that idea of playing professional soccer. Eventually, and after about two years, I moved to Los Angeles, California, where I was uh, accepted at the Stella Adler Conservatory of Acting in Hollywood. Um, and I began a two-year program, which actually ended up being about three years. By the second year, I was already working in plays. Um, so, and I booked a feature film. So I had to prolong my two-year program into a three-year program. The first years in Los Angeles were a pretty fun adventure. I was living in a tiny, tiny sailboat that my friend owned in the marina and gradually discovering the real world behind what is known as Hollywood. It was a very magical chapter and I was motivated to be part of productions and projects that will inspire others that could change lives, like so many productions have touched me deeply in the past. I dreamt even that one night I will personally drive my red 87 Volkswagen Cabriolet to the Oscars. I will grab my winning Oscar, wrap it in a small Colombian flag, and in front of millions of spectators, I will proclaim to my fellow Latino souls and the rest of the world that we all are equally equipped with what we need to achieve anything our heart desires. I love very much that chapter as an actor, as an artist on stage in front of the cameras, the whole creative process, it was so fun, so joyful, and I love just to play, which is what you do as an actor, you play. What became more challenging was the whole business aspect to it. I just never been good at the business of being fake. So I was not going out to the parties and I was trying to socialize and trying to get parts and this and that. Plus, sometimes dealing with agents and telling you, you got to go here, you got to do this, you got to do that. I just, there was something with me that just didn't feel comfortable with that part. And the straw that really broke the camel's back was my experience on my first Vipassana retreat. Vipassana is an ancient technique, method of meditation the one that the Buddha that we know, Gautama Buddha, practice. So there is the 12-day meditation, Vipassana meditation, which out of those 12 days, 10 are silent. And during my first Vipassana, which is a really powerful way to dissect your mind, I realized that the way I was working as an actor was hurting me more than anything else. The reason why I had moved away from Colombia and I was moving towards this path and the reason why I've been practicing meditation and yoga for some time at this point in my life was to, in a way, heal myself. Growing up at home in a very intense and sort of violent environment and whether I know it consciously or not, since the divorce of my parents at a very young age, there was a sense within me that I was not enough, that I was not loved, that perhaps even a lot of things that happened between my parents were my own fault. So healing 
became the purpose of my life, which, by the way, I would not change anything of the way I grew up and the environment I grew up because as a result of that, I have become who I become. As a result of that, I had this level of compassion, kinship, kindness. And because my own experience, I truly have empathy for those who are going through pain, suffering, and so on. And also, in the process, developing tools that can help those in need. So I'm deeply grateful for the way I grew up and what that eventually gave me as a purpose of life. Back in the Vipassana retreat, as I was dissecting my mind, sitting down for about 14 hours a day in quiet meditation, I started to realize that the way I was playing all these characters, it was very intense and it was creating a lot of deep ingrained memories, sometimes violent, hurtful, hateful memories. And that I was playing these characters at such a level that my psychic was not really identifying whether this were just fake experiences I was creating, emotions, or it was real. And that was a degree that I was playing these characters. So I realized that I was hurting myself, that I was creating more damage than anything else. So that was perhaps what eventually helped me to realize that the way I wanted to continue moving on in my life and contribute was very different. I didn't really knew how, but I knew that I needed to make a change in my life. And like Ram Dass says beautifully, hold on tightly and let go lightly. Hold on tightly and let go lightly. Shortly after this Vipassana retreat, I was attending one of the yoga classes I used to attend here in Los Angeles, California. With At that time, um, I was practicing with Brian Kest. And I remember before the class, I was standing there and I look at the room and I see all these people and I see the whole thing and I had the realization. And even though I've been practicing yoga and meditation for a while this time, I never had any inclination to 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 take that path but that precise day i remember having this sort of vivid vision of of how this could be my next chapter how this could become my next platform to inspire to serve to contribute i imagine that the yoga room it was my new stage and I could create any sort of experience, an uplifting experience. I had the crowd, I had the stage, lights, sound, infinite ways to create. Therefore, guided by that inner belief that everything was going to be all right, I decided right there on the spot to start my journey into this path of service as a yoga instructor. I've always been sort of a, a rebel in a way that not really good at following uh, instructions and sort of like the standards. I'm always being someone who likes to, to explore, to try things and see what really makes makes sense. As I say, there's a big difference between someone who is skeptical and someone who is a cynical. So I believe I'm more in the first category of skeptical, which means simply 
I like to try things and out of my experience, what really works, I like to observe and adapt and what doesn't work, what doesn't align, I simply discard. Whereas a cynical person is the one that no matter what, they will never believe that something out of the ordinary or out of the narrow understanding they have is going to actually going to work out. So I decided to give myself about a year to prepare myself into this journey of a yoga instructor. I had lunch with uh, my dear friend, teacher, Brian Kest, and um, explore the possibilities of what will be a good preparation for this journey. So for about a year, I did, I did a lot of reading, uh, explored different things. Uh, I even did this online thing, and this is way back on 2004, I believe. So it was more of a, a thing where they send you books and things. Um, it wasn't like nowadays that you can be right on Zoom. And after a year, I jump into the waters of serving as a yoga instructor. I didn't know how it was going to work, but again, I knew that everything was going to be all right. I had bills to pay. I have to make a living. But somehow I knew that everything was going to be okay. Once I made that decision, like Joseph Campbell said, when you follow your bliss, doors will open where you will not have thought there will be doors. I had no clue what I was doing as a yoga instructor. And until this day, I have no clue what I'm doing. But one thing I'm certain by is that everything I do comes from a, a, an honest place, a sincere place, a place where I long to connect. It's my heart's desire. I don't do anything to please anybody, to look for acceptance, to be liked. I do it because it feels natural. As well, I have never identified with the roles I'm playing externally. I have never identified myself as a copywriter or a yoga instructor or artist. These are just aspects of myself that I express into this sort of called realm of existence. But who am I? It's beyond any logical and cerebral kind of explanation. At this point in my life, I had a, a little bit better sense of who am I and my purpose. And that is to be in the business of making people feel good. Because that for me is the higher purpose in life. And when I talk about making people feel good, we have to understand that it's not coming from a place of, oh, I'm going to sacrifice myself. I'm going to starve to death. So other people are going to be okay and everybody's going to be inspired and I'm going to be this martyr so people can learn from that. I like to be in the business of making people feel good because I like to inspire. I like to come from a place of me being in the best possible shape at all levels and in that way be an inspiration through my actions. Words don't really teach anything. What really teaches is action. So through my actions, throughout my day to day, I try to do my best and I cultivate practices that help me to stay open, grounded, and connected to my heart. Of course, there's many times when that doesn't happen, but the most important, it's not whether we're keeping score if that's happened or not. The most important is the intention that we show up. As said by the great 
Indian saint, Nim Karoli Baba Maharaji, the highest way to live our lives, the way we can all experience true bliss and true liberation, it's by serving everyone, loving everyone, and always remembering God. And nowadays in this era that we're living, known as the Kali Yuga, the times where we forget about source, about God, Goddess, universe, however you want to call it, this whole God business can be tricky. But ultimately, if rather than doing things, serving, or as I call it, be in the business of making people feel good, if we are completely honest and clear that our actions don't come from a place of, look at me, oh, I'm so good, I'm such a good person, I'm such a hu good human being, look at me, how I feed the poor, look at me, how I give a hand to the one in need. Rather than identifying ourselves with that, if it comes from an honest place, if it comes as a service to the divine, as a service to God, as a service to the infinite collective consciousness, it really changes the experience. When you identify as the doer, look at me, how good I am, I'm doing this, it becomes a very intense and stressful weight that you have to carry on your back. It's like you always intellectually are trying to do the right thing. It becomes an inner turmoil. Whereas when you do this from a place of offering this to the highest, to the divine, to God, whatever you call it, it becomes a way to naturally connect with your true essence. For example, if my daughter is playing, I mean, she's only four months old, but still she's playing a couple of times and she's almost about to crawl. If I see that she's falling to the ground, I'm going to pick her up and I'm going to provide a little bit of nourishment in that time. And I'm not doing that. So you can look at me and say, oh, you're so good, such a good dad. It's just my inner nature and there's nothing blocking me there. There's no agenda. It's just my inner nature. So the more we get to connect with our inner nature, the more this serving others, being in the business of making people feel good becomes our natural way of behaving in this lifetime. Therefore, the more you cultivate these practices that help you to maintain your heart open, connected, and grounded, the more you're going to understand that when you make people feel good, automatically you're making yourself feel good. That when you act from the right place, and it doesn't have to be a human, it could be nature, it could be an animal, when you are coming from this loving, caring, compassionate, kind, generous place, that's the experience you're going to have in return. It's called karma. What you give out is what you're going to get back. And this business of making people feel good can be expressed in so many ways. You don't have to become a yoga instructor or meditation teacher. You don't have to become a priest or give up all your possessions and all that. There are infinite ways where you can participate and enroll yourself into the business of making people feel good. As Gandhi said, we must be guided in our policy by our sense of right, not by the lure of winning cheap popularity. It is the practice of emptiness, truthfulness, openness, the practice of non-identification. 
in a beautiful way, the more you practice not identifying, the more you can identify with the everything, with everyone. Realizing that your happiness is my happiness, your pain is my pain, your joy is my joy, your laughter is my laughter. I'd like to share with you this um, entering of uh, my journal, one of my trips to India. So I can give you a little bit of context of this whole thing of seeing myself reflecting others and how by making people feel good, I automatically feel good. July 15, 2016. There is a big old-fashioned standing fan behind me, blowing a mixture of fresh air and clutter that been stuck to the propeller. It is about 120 degrees here in South Delhi in India, and the ocean of people, cows, rickshaws, beggars, street vendors, and more make it feel like a blazing oven. Sitting at this Daba roadside restaurant, I'm amazed by the rhythm of the chapati flatbread maker. He's wearing a colorful sort of bandana on his forehead and an old tattered tank top. His hands move with an eastern flare as the dog shapes in the air into a little round flatbread. There is no fan at his station and the hot cold burns just to look at. He's probably experiencing an extra 50 degrees of heat while he works more than 12 hours a day and making somewhere around $4 for his shift. Besides the fresh aroma of chapatis, the only other thing emerging from his side, it is this incredible sense of joy. His smile is constant and as radiant as the Taj Mahal. There is soul and total commitment to his actions. Suddenly, the scene stops as a young, thin man dressed like he's going to an executive meeting. Only somehow he lost his tie and untucked the spot where the shirt merged with his pants. Stands in front of me and greets me with the traditional Namaste, also known as the Hello of India. I order a side of dal fry, aloo gobi, and of course, a couple of chapatis, but politely decline the water, unless I want to spend the rest of my day in the bathroom in the squatted position. I don't know really how to describe this, but I start to experience this sort of game with him. A game which happens often, I should say where I notice there is this spark in the eye, almost like a laughter, a sense of familiarity, a language that is expressed beyond words, a sense of ease, a beautiful and lover reflection, like a magical mirror that you can look at and only experience deep compassion. The waiter takes my order and disappears into the crowd just as another beautiful character emerged from the table behind. Wearing linen white shorts and a t-shirt, a boy about nine turns his face to proudly show a distinct mustache in the making, like an old beautiful soul trap in this body. He lifts his right hand and a unique gesture greets me while he finishes cleaning. The food doesn't take much to arrive. It's fresh, tasty, and very mild on the spicy side. Throughout my meal, I have the normal interactions with the waiter. Thank you. Don't want more of this. All is well. The bill, please. That sort of thing. After a pleasant dining experience, I leave the restaurant and hand a decent tip to my helper. He doesn't seem to care much about the currency. His whole being seems more focused on something deep yet fresh. Something that connects us at a profound level. Like he's living by a higher code. I say goodbye and dan Thank you. 
cross the street after avoiding many almost accidents with cars, motorcycles, and with what looks like a bicycle, but it has a king-size bed on top. I walk across the street into the apartment that a generous Indian friend has lent us to stay for the last couple of days in India. We start packing our staff a very mellow way. It's about 4 p.m. and uh, we call to reserve a taxi to take us to the airport and the taxi will come to pick us around 1 a.m. With plenty of time, we take it easy, enjoy a final refreshing cold shower, take care of the last details. The taxi arrives much earlier than expected. Therefore, the calmness turned quickly into a little bit of a rush. I'm the last to leave and make sure we have everything as I always do at any place I stay. I take a moment to express my gratitude for the shelter over my head. They say that walls have ears. After that, I get downstairs. The trunk of the taxi is open. And the taxi driver is standing with a very tight Superman t-shirt. And surprisingly, I see the waiter from earlier standing next to the driver. As I stand in front of the waiter, he opens his arms wide and we embrace in a space of mutual gratitude. His energy is telling me, thank you very much for acknowledging me earlier, especially in a place like this one, where sometimes the caste system takes away the human connection. Thank you for your kindness for treating me as equal. And I'm hugging him like he's the most sacred person in whole India, which in that moment he is. I get inside the taxi and the waiter standing next to me. It's looking with this sort of penetrating gaze. His head bubbles in an Indian fashion. But beyond that, in a motion of affirmation that we indeed had a connection of a higher code. The engine starts as the car begins rolling. My Indian ordinary teacher disappears behind in a cloud of dust and few drops from the monsoon rains. A waiter in a humble side road restaurant, a taxi driver, a bathroom cleaner, a renowned teacher, a war veteran, a singer, a sibling, a politician, a beggar, a cop, a dancer. This world is full of teachers teachers that remind us of the beauty residing within each one of us. In a world of technology, social media, everything seems to be moving extremely fast. Our ability to connect is rapidly fading away, making it pretty much impossible to engage. Am I the amount of likes I get from my Instagram post? Does my self-worth depend on the comments of others on my Facebook page? Nowadays, we have become extremely good at our ability to move away really fast from who we truly are, from the bliss that we naturally are, the shining light, the radiance in our hearts. We must certainly become the adults we needed when we were children. It might take many attempts and change is something we need to adopt to maintain that flexibility. It is really all about the journey. None of us like to go to the movies just to watch the end. None of us pick a book just to read the last pages. 
At 24, I moved to the United States away from my motherland, Colombia, after working in those years in advertising. At 28, I had already three lead roles under my belt as an actor in feature films in Hollywood. At 30, I was playing with my rock band at the Sunset Strip Clubs in LA. At 32, I became a full-time yoga instructor. At 38, I released my first Kirtan Mantra album. At 46, I started this podcast. And also at this point, it just feels like the world is my oyster. Who you think you are might be a very distant and narrow concept of who you really are. Be open to change. Be flexible. Be willing to reinvent yourself when needed. Keep on learning, growing, expanding. Stay curious. There are no rules. Only the blocking beliefs that we create. You can choose to be whomever you want to be at any time. This is your chance, not your parents or anybody else but yours. Like an actor on stage, you can play any role you wish. The essence of who you really are, that flame, that light, will simply illuminate and support your choice. Finally, I invite you to join us on this business of making people feel good. Focus on what really brings joy to yourself, to your soul, what feels natural, and continue moving with determination in that direction because that's the most powerful to make people feel good. The more you shine, the more you emanate that radiance from your heart, that joy, the more you're going to make people feel good naturally. And continue serving lots and lots of love. Mm -hmm.